Another very lovely, lovely evening to all of you, my dear friends. I'm here. So thankful that you're welcome to join me once again, as always. We left off now. We're part 26 on our study on the life of Christ with Jesus approaching this healed man, the man born blind. He approaches this healed man and he says, do you believe in the Son of God? And he says, yes. And then he directs his attention to these Pharisees. And it end, we ended with uh, Christ dialoguing with them on whether they're blind. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Now, what Jesus would have been referencing back then looks something like this. All right. It would have been difficult for anything to get. It. It's not like the gates and fences that we have of today. The oriental sheepfolds are commonly walled or palisaded with one door or a gate. Into one of these enclosures, several shepherds drive their flocks, leaving them in charge of an under shepherd or porter who fastens the door securely inside and remains with the sheep all night. Now, this is important for what Jesus is about to explain. You have to know kind of what he's uh, describing. In the morning, the shepherds come to the door. The porter opens to them, and each calls away his own sheep. Climbeth up by some other way, Gil made comment on. By hypocrisy and deceit, he means, these that don't enter by the door. Whoever does not introduce the sheep through the door of the sheepfold, know that that man is a thief and a robber. Now you would think, well, isn't a thief a robber? Which the Pharisees were so far from doing that they would not allow those that were entering to go in. The difference between a thief and a robber with the Jews was that the former, the thief, took away a man's property privately and the latter, a robber, did it openly. Jesus goes on to explain that he is the door. So who is this shepherd of the sheep? Christ does not here refer to himself, for he is the way or door by which others enter. We'll come to that verse. But he refers to all the ministers of the gospel who have access to the church by him, pastors in particular. To him the porter openeth, the man that stayed all night to the porter. And the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. In the allegory, the fold, the sheepfold, is the church. The door is Christ. The sheep are the elect. The shepherds are God's ministers. The porter is perhaps best to understand the Holy Spirit as signified under this figure as he's there all night with them. That's the way some of them view the porter. He who grants opportunities of coming or of bringing others through Christ into the kingdom of God. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him. For they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. You see, many will try to lead the sheep away. Or the elect. Jesus even prophesies that of these days especially. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible they shall deceive the very elect or the sheep. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not but for to steal, and to kill, and to destroy. I am come that they might have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. James and Foster Brown noted on this, shall go in and out. You would think that they would just come in and be safe within the sheepfold, but he's also talking about going out. In as to a place of safety and repose, out as to green pastures and still waters for nourishment and refreshing. But he also says that they'll have life and life more abundantly. They shall not merely have life, simple, bare existence. But they shall have all those superadded things which are needful to make that life eminently blessed and happy. It would be vast mercy to keep men merely from annihilation or hell. But Jesus will give them eternal joy, peace, the society of the blessed, and all those exalted means of felicity which are prepared for them in the world of glory. 
Now Christ refers to himself as the good shepherd, the good shepherd, not just one of these shepherds. As we have already uh, discussed, he's the exalted one. He's also the door and the way, and he's every, every bit of it. It's really lovely. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep, but he that is a hireling and not the shepherd, whose own the sheep are not, seeth the wolf coming and leaveth the sheep and fleeth, and the wolf catcheth them and scattereth the sheep. It's presumed that he's talking about with these hirelings, these false prophets. The hireling fleeth because he is a hireling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known of mine. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. I think that it's pretty obvious that he's talking about the Gentiles with those not of this fold. Therefore doth the Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it up again. No man taketh it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it again. This commandment have I received of my father. John Gill noted, which life he took up again by his divine power, and as the surety of his people, to use it for their good, by ascending to his God and theirs, entering into heaven as their forerunner, appearing in the presence of God for them as their advocate, and ever living to make intercession for them. Uh, I, I don't know how much more that could be asked of anyone. And the fact that our God, the only God, the living God, is the one whom does all of this for us, there's, there's no greater joy that one can experience. No greater security and, and, uh, and just uh, uh, the brightest of futures. And this is something incredibly lovely of Jesus right here, that he did not succumb to the machinations of his foes. To the last, he was free to choose another exit from life. If you'll remember what Christ even says, thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled that thus it must be? Jesus tells us right there in those verses, he says, if I pray to God to send me 12 thousands and thousands of angels, he says he will do it. So not only, though, was it the father's will that we come to heaven with him, but it's also the son's will that we come to heaven so much so that he chose to go through this as well. There was a division, therefore, again, among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear ye him? Others said, These are not the words of him that hath the devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication. And it was winter, and Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Right here would have been Solomon's porch. So Jesus is right around this area. And uh, it's winter. But what was this Feast of Dedication? It's also called the Feast of Renewal, founded by Judas Maccabeus to commemorate the purification and consecration anew of the temple after its desecration by Antiochus Epiphanes. Celebrated for eight days every year from the 25th Kislev onwards, the middle of December would have been this winter time, and especially distinguished by the illumination of the houses. Then came the Jews round about him, and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. <laughs> it strikes me. They, they say, How long dost thou make us to doubt? He's trying to get them to believe. <laughs> and they say, No, you're making us doubt. What are you talking about? Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Keep 
very good in your memory just for these next couple of verses. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand, Jesus says. Cambridge noted this passage in no way asserts the indefectibility of the elect and gives no countenance to ultra predestina uh, predestinarian views. Christ's sheep cannot be taken from him against their will, but their will is free, and they may choose to leave the flock. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. See, so now he says that we are in his hand, and now he says that we are in the Father's hand. I and my Father are one, and the Jews know what he's saying right here. Those that would pluck them out of my hand, Paul noted, and deprive them of that eternal life which I will give them must be too strong, not for me alone, but for my Father also, which none is. For who can be too strong for omnipotence, all power? Christ has just implied that his hand and the Father's hand are one, which implies that he and the Father are one. They are one in power, in will, and in action. They would stone him for making himself God, which they would not have done had he not asserted or implied that he and the Father were one in substance, not merely in will. And Christ does not correct them whenever they're about to want to stone him again. He doesn't say, hey, guys, you know, I was just you, you misinterpreted. No, he does not. As assuredly, he would have done had their animosity arisen out of a gross misapprehension of his words. He means what he's saying right here. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of those works do ye stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Anyone in whom says Jesus never asserted that he was God in the flesh, they knew exactly what he was talking about back then. That's why they're wanting to kill. It says plainly in this verse that he made himself God. Jesus answered them, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God. Now we've went over this quite often whenever we talk about these false prophets, how they, how they take this completely out of context. I said, ye are gods. Once again, that's not meaning Thor or <laughs> any of these uh, Horus or any of that. That's not meaning any of it. Ye are gods. In Psalm 82, 6, it says this. This was said of magistrates or judges, lawmakers, lawgivers, on account of the dignity and honor of their office, people in power and government. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works, that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in him. Jesus right here, he's trying to reason with them. Just as in Isaiah, the very first chapter, where he says, Come and let us reason together. He's constantly trying to reason with people. For all this, the Old Testament had been a preparation, but their minds had not been prepared by it. He will take, therefore, their own lower ground and appeal to the side of those who have not faith. Let them test the works. Think of their character, as some of them had already done, and see at least that these are of the Father. Therefore they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand and went away again beyond Jordan and to the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. This is talk, uh, talking namely about Bethabara. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true, and many believed on him there. It, it, it is quite, it's, a, it's very noticeable whenever you see it. It says right here, John Baptist did no miracle whatsoever. And for 400 years before John, we're not told about any miracles ever occurring. That is the longest dry spell that uh, the Israelites in general, the Jews then, how, that's the longest dry spell that they ever experienced. No miracle whatsoever. And then Jesus comes along, and it's just like this spotlight is just honed in just on him. Even John Baptist did not one miracle, even though it says that he comes in the spirit of Elijah, whom did great miracles. But John did no miracle, and there's a reason behind that, so that Jesus could, all the attention could be on him. Even John knew this. John Baptist said, I must decrease, he must increase. He said, don't put any spotlight on me. 
But, uh, yeah, and then, and then Jesus comes along and does all kinds of miracles, and he's all that they're talking about, and they still don't believe, and that's shocking. But uh, that is it for today's study, my dear friends. I'm very thankful once again that you all could join me. I hope that you all come back. And um, Lord willing, tomorrow we'll be picking up in part 28. Lord of peace be with you. Amen.